we're live uh, hello everyone uh, good afternoon it's a big pleasure to introduce you to dr orly hasgur uh, from university of exeter in the uk uh, she has a, one of, she's one of the main uh, speakers like from the course so she has a big biography that will take some time for me to read but i guess sums up a little bit about everything that she has been working on uh, across her career so uh, Dr. Orly is a senior lecturer in ecology at the University of Exeter in the UK. She's a leader of the Global, Genetic, Global Change Genetics Group, which currently includes six PhD, PhD students. She did her PhD at the University of Bristol under the supervision of Professor uh, Garrett Jones, followed by uh, research fellowships at the University of Stirling and the University of Bristol as well. Uh, she held a she held now a lectureship in ecology at the University of no she held sorry in the past a lectureship uh, in ecology at the University of Southampton from 2015 to 2019 before moving now to Exeter uh, in her group she researched the ecological and evolutionary responses of biodiversity to global environmental change through integrating genomic tools with ecological data and modeling approaches much of her research focuses on bats but she has also uh, other studies uh, with other taxa, such as primates as well. Um, her research program encompasses four main areas of investigation. So using genomic uh, approaches to investigate species responses to climate change, using genomic genetic data to relate landscape and environmental heter heterogeneity uh, to movement processes, uh, ecological interactions and resource partitioning across spatial scales, and biogeography and model-based inference of uh, evolutionary and demographic history. You can read more on her, uh, her website as well. And after the talk, we have, we're going to have a talk with her. But now you can listen to uh, her talk uh, called Integrating Genomic Data into Climate Change Vulnerability Assessments. So it's a big, big pleasure to have here Dr. Orly Hasgur. Thank you very much, Nani. I'm just going to share my screen. OK. Okay, and I hope you can all see my presentation now. So I'm going to talk to you today about how we can integrate genomic data into climate change vulnerability assessments. So over the last year, we've all been mainly concerned about the impacts of global pandemics, but this is not really the only global challenge that we're facing. A report that recently came out by the World Meteorological Organization about the state of global climate in 2020 shows that average temperatures in 2020 were around 1.2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And in fact, the whole de decade of 2011 to 2020 was the warmest decade on records. Now, 2020 was the third warmest year after 2019 and 2016. So you can see a pattern here. And temperatures were extremely warm, especially around the Arctic. And despite all these agreement, international agreements that have been signed, still 2011 is set to be one of the years with the highest increase in the production of CO2. So why is climate change actually a problem? Well, these changes that we're causing to the climate have major impacts on biodiversity. And it's a really a major threat to biodiversity and the ecosystem services they provide. But not just this, it's also a threat to our food security and in generally our survival. So what's predicted to happen is that by the end of the century, much of the parts of the globe will become significantly warmer than what they currently are. Now, in terms of patterns of rainfall, they're predicted to become a lot more variable, with some areas like the Mediterranean Basin, so it's found uh, the south of Europe, north of Africa, is predicted to become much drier with higher increased fre frequency of droughts. And what this means is that climatic conditions will become unsuitable for many organisms and will force many organisms to shift their range in pursuit of more suitable conditions. And we're already seeing evidence of this happening. But the problem is that climate change is not happening on its own. It's happening over this backdrop of very intensive anthropogenic land use changes, resulting in habitat loss, degradation and fragmentation. And that means that organisms cannot just simply move across the landscape as freely as they would have liked to reach the climatically suitable areas. So how would biodiversity respond to this interacting stresses will really depend on the extent and magnitude of the changes, but also in, about intrinsic factors 
within organisms themselves. So first of all, their sensitivity to changes, but also their adaptive capacity or phenotypic plasticity, as well as their ability to move away. So commonly, in order to assess biodiversity vulnerability to climate change, people use uh, species distribution modeling, also known as climatic niche modeling or ecological niche modeling. Now, these are correlative modeling approaches. How they work is that they use information about where the species is currently known to be found, looking at environmental variables and climatic conditions where the species is currently found. They use uh, statistical and dynamic modeling to project where climatically suitable for the species are found across a wider geographical areas. Now, these kind of models can be combined with future climate change projections in order to project where suitable conditions may be found in the future. Now, these models have been used extensively. For example, a key study by Thomas and colleagues from 2004 predicted that 18 to 35 percent of species globally will be committed to extinction by the end of the century. And the differences depends on the emotion scenarios. But these kind of correlative predictive approaches have been criticized for being oversimplistic and really disregarding important processes that affect the response of biodiversity to climate change, like evolution and adaptive capacity, physio physiology, thermal tolerance, for example, and phenotypic plasticity, dispersal ability and barriers to dispose, dispersal, as well as species interactions. So what we do in my group, we try to, in a way, overcome some of these uh, problems and gaps in our ability to project response of biodiversity to climate change. And we do this through using integrated approaches. So we combine genomic data with ecological data and environmental data and use different modeling approaches in order to really assess how biodiversity is likely to be affected by future changes like climate change. Now, this kind of research has been made possible thanks to the genomic revolution that has happened over the last few decades. So I don't know if you remember the Human Genome Project. It was like the feat of biological sciences. Um, it was completed, the whole of the human genome was sequenced, um, sequence was completed and assembled um, by 2003. So this whole process took about 13 years. It involved over 20 institutions across six countries. It cost well more than $2 billion. Now, if I wanted to sequence the human genome now, it would take around 24 hours and will cost around $1,000. This is a massive difference. Difference And what really enabled this difference is technological development in sequencing and the development of high throughput sequencing, also known as next generation sequencing. And what this means right now, the genomic research is open to non-model organisms and like species of conservation concern, as well as to study adaptations in wild populations. So this has really shifted the field uh, from using genetic data into using genomic data. And what this really means is that now we have much more markers with greater coverage of what's happening across the genome. We have better resolution for any of the analysis we're carrying out. And this has improved estimations of genetic variation, population size, migration rates, um, gene flow, phylogenetic relationships. It's also improved the inference about demographic or evolutionary history. But more than anything, it enables us to really study adaptive variation, selection, and evolution. So the kind of research I do, a lot of it focuses on bats. And people ask me, why bats? Well, first of all, they're very species rich, so they're 20% of uh, mammals with over 1,400 species. They're also very diverse in terms of their habitat use, their trophic ecology. They carry out important ecosystem services like pollination, seed dispersal, forest regeneration, and control of insect pest populations. But in terms of understanding climate change, the distribution is distributed really across the globe. So we can see very interesting adaptations to very different climatic and environmental conditions. Moreover, we know that bats carry many zoonotic uh, pathogens, including, for example, coronaviruses. So it's very important to be able to understand how climate change will affect their distribution. So why do we think bats may be sensitive to climate change? Well, they have these very large membranous wings 
which means that they can lose a lot of water through evaporation. And studies have shown that bats that are found in arid environment have specific physiological adaptations for reduced evaporative water loss. Now we do know that bats are sensitive to increased temperatures and we have seen mass mortality events following heat waves in Australia, for example. So what this really means that bats will require some physiological adaptations in order to survive under drier and warmer conditions. So the conditions likely to occur under future climate change. And there's been several modeling studies looking at how climate change will affect bats, showing in many cases that species are likely to experience range losses. So for example, here is a study by Rabello and colleagues of the impact of future climate change on European bats focusing in particular on Mediterranean species. Now, the reason why I'm particularly interested in the Mediterranean basin, which as I said, is found in the south of Europe, is because this area is likely to experience very severe effects of climate change. And in fact, we're already seeing climate change happening there with increased heat wave events, but also particularly with increased droughts and summer droughts. So what this study shows that uh, this predictive models show that many Mediterranean bat species will lose their entire current suitable range. And in fact, the whole distribution will shift to outside the Mediterranean basin. OK, so my, today I'm going to start by giving a brief introduction to the genomic approaches that I use in my research. Then I'm going to show you how they can be applied to look at adaptive responses and to look at dispersal and barriers to movement. And I'm going to finish by talking about how an integrated approach and integrated framework that we develop and show you how it can be applied to really inform conservation management under climate change. So starting with an introduction to the genomic approaches. So how do we start from the field into our actual genomic data? Well, we go out and we catch bats using, for example, mist nets. Then we sample the bats using wing biopsy punches, so these tiny little circles here, put the samples in a preservation buffer and take it back to the lab. In the lab, we will extract DNA from the samples and then build sequencing libraries and sequence uh, the DNA um, using high throughput sequencing approaches. So there's different approach you can use to sequence uh, the DNA and get genomic data sets. The best approach in a way will be to sequence the whole of the genome. This gives you really an information for everything that happens. However, despite the reduced in cost, this is still quite cost prohibitive. prohibitive. Uh, so it's still quite expensive cost, especially when you think about species that are under study, so they don't have a reference genome yet. So instead, what we use is reduced genome representation approach. So instead of sequencing the whole genome, we sequence parts of the genome which gives us a good idea of what happens across the genome at a much more reduced cost. Now, the approach that we use is restriction side association DNA sequencing, also known as RADSEQ. How it worked, use restrict restrictive enzymes to digest and parts of the genome. So it's in a way, it cuts the genome into smaller parts. You, gen you then ligate adapters to it, as well as barcodes so we can identify uh, each individual and send it to high throughput of parallel sequencing. Now, the data we get back from the sequencing facility, we first demultiplex it. So we can, every read or sequence that we get, we can identify the individual that it belongs to. We then assemble our different sequences into what we call RAD tags. So we stack them together, similar sequences that come from the same area. And we use that to call SNPs, so single nucleotide polymorphism. These are area of the genome where we have variation in the alleles between individuals, so different alleles between individuals. And then we carry out quality control and filtering in order to remove individuals there with very large amounts of missing data or SNPs, or parts of the genome, which I will call also uh, loci, for example that have high frequency of missing data or low variability among individuals. So we end up with our SNP data set. In the first stage we do, we identify loci that are under selection. In order to divide a data set into two different data sets, a neutral data set that only have neutral loci or neutral SNPs and an adaptive data set. And that's where we have those uh, SNPs that have been identified as being under selection.
So we use the neutral data set to look at genetic diversity, inbreeding, population structure, landscape genetics, which I'll talk about in a second, and different demographic parameters like effective population size, as well as demographic history. So these are all kind of tests that require a data set that doesn't include any loci that are under selection. We're going to use the adaptive data set to identify genes that are under selection, carry out things like gene ontology analysis to identify the pathways involved in those genes, and also in uh, analysis and uh, evolutionary inferences. So as I said, we're using reduced genome representation approaches instead of the whole genomes. And that does have some advantages. First of all, due to the lower cost, so it's very cost effective, it means that we can sequence a high number of individuals and samples. And this is very important when we want to understand adaptations, for example, across species ranges. You get greater depth of coverage per locus than you would get from many resequencing studies that are done at very low coverage. It doesn't require any prior genome information, so you can do it for species that don't have a reference genome. In terms of bioinformatics, it's less intensive, so you need less computer cluster time. But it does have some disadvantages as well. So if you don't have a reference genome, you do need to have higher coverage, which increases the costs. And most importantly, you only cover, really you only sequence a small proportion of the genome, around 5%. Even though it's spread across the genome, it's still a small proportion. And that means that you miss many loci that are potentially under selection. And some uh, studies have come up uh, asking whether it may be too sparse to actually detect any adaptive loci. And if you don't have a reference genome, in the end of the day, what you end up with adaptive loci, so you, uh, with anonymous loci, that you can't always relate to any genes. So you're missing quite a lot of information there. Okay, other methods that I wanted to cover briefly is identifying adaptive uh, loci and how do we do that? So one approach to use comes from the field of population genomics, and this is using outlayer scans. So these type of scans, um, they look at uh, the genetic differentiation at different loci. Those um, between de genetic differentiation between populations. Now, those loci that have very high levels of genetic differentiation are likely to be those loci that are under selection. So this is something an analysis that carried out at the population level. The second type of approach comes from the more landscape genomic field, and this is genotype environmental association analysis or environmental association analysis. And this kind of approach really builds on GWAS study, so genome-wide association studies. So GWAS study look at uh, the association between allele frequency, so the genotype, and uh, different phenotypes that are connected to fitness. Now in the genotype environmental association analysis, what we replace is phenotype by environment. So we look at the relationship between allele frequency and the environmental conditions experienced by the individuals. So this is something that can really tell us about local uh, adaptation, local environmental adaptations. So unlike outlayer scans that would just give us general information about which loci is under selection, in case of this kind of analysis, we actually know what climatic variables, for example, or environmental variables, the loci is associated with. Uh, moreover, unlike outlayer scans that are really more focused on hard selective sweeps, genotype environmental association analysis can identify also the softer selective sweeps, which are likely to be more involved in local environmental adaptations. So we start with applications now. So first, how we can use genomic approaches to understand adaptive responses to climate change. So why do we actually need to even think about anything like this? If we think about how currently species distribution models work, they assume that the species across its entire range is one single unit and will respond identically to climate change. So imagine for this species, Miotis dubentoni, which is found across Europe, but assume that populations that are found at the south of Spain will respond exactly as populations that are found in Scandinavian countries. And we know this is not likely to be the case because those that are found in the south of Spain are adapted to much warmer and drier climatic conditions than those that are found, for example, in the UK. So we developed a framework that helps you consider adaptive genetic variation in assessment of range losses or range changes under climate change. And we use uh, 
a set of cryptic uh, bat species to show how this framework works. For these two cryptic bat species, Meotis escalare and Meotis crypticus, are restricted to the Mediterranean basin. Meotis escalare is restricted to the Iberian Peninsula, that's Spain and Portugal, marked here with red um, circles, while Meotis crypticus is found at the northern parts of Spain, southern France and uh, Italy in triangles here. And we generated a genomic data set using RADSEQ um, of around 20,000 SNPs for these bats. So first looking at population structure, we can see that Meotis escalari is divided into three main population clusters, while Meotis crypticus is divided into four population clusters that are quite geographically distinct. First stage we do is to identify local climatic adaptations. And to do this, we use a combination of two genotype environmental association analysis approach. The first is redundancy analysis, and the second is latent factor mix models. Both of these approach look at the relationship between allele frequency and climatic variables of interest, taking into account population structure. Now, in our case, what we're interested in, the climatic conditions we're interested in are maximum temperatures and summer rainfall. And the reason for that is that these two conditions are likely to change, are predicted to change dramatically around the Mediterranean basin and the climate change. But also these are conditions that are very important for bats. So we saw how we, we've, we've had mass mortality events of bats under heat waves. So maximum temperatures is something that would affect bat survival. Now in terms of uh, summer rainfall, the bats that we're looking at are insectivorous bats. They reproduce during the summer and the reproductive success really relies on the availability of insects. And there's a relationship between water availability in these relatively dry habitats in the summer and insect availability. So under reduced water availability, bats will not have as much food, and as a result of that, the reproductive success will be affected. So we combine the data from these two genotype environment association analysis approaches, and we identify 32 and 38 SNPs in each one of our um, but corresponding to genomic regions that are associated with maximum temperatures and summer rainfall. What we do then, we plot to find where individuals fall across the ordination space relative to the two climatic variables of interest based on the genomic makeup in these two, in these 32 and 38 climate adaptive SNPs. And we see that some of our individuals fall closer to warm and dry temperatures, some fall closer to cold and wet temperatures, whereas others are more intermediate fall in the middle. So we divide those individuals that are associated with hot and dry conditions marked in white, and those that are associated with cold and, white, cold and wet conditions marked in gray, and we remove the intermediate individuals from the analysis. Then we directly incorporate the information into our species distribution models. So the models you see here on your left were generated using all the location records that we have uh, for these bats. The top model is under present conditions and the bottom under future conditions using the more severe climate change or emission scenario for 2070. And these were models that were generated for Meiotis escalare, the species that is restricted to the Iberian Peninsula. Now in the maps here that you see, blue and green colors represent unsuitable climatic conditions whereas orange and yellow represent suitable climatic conditions. And if we compare the two maps, what we can see that in the future climate change, the species is projected to lose much of its current suitable range in the Iberian Peninsula. The next the models that you see on your right were generated separately for individuals that are associated with hot and dry conditions in red and cold and wet conditions in blue. And in yellow, we have areas of overlap. So once again, the top is present conditions, the bottom is future conditions. And if we compare two future maps together, we can see that when we take adaptive variation into account in our models, we have much more reduced range losses across the species ranges. And in fact, much of the Iberian Peninsula still remains climatically suitable for these bats. Now we see the same situation in the other uh, bat species, Meotis crypticus. But what's interesting also in this bat species, if you look at their future map generated for hot, dry and cold, wet genotype, is that we see an expansion of the hot and dry genotypes in red on the expense of the cold and wet genotypes in blue. 
on the code in which genotypes, in fact, entirely disappear from the Iberian Peninsula, southern France and Italy, with the exception of the Alps. So what this work really shows is the importance of considering adaptive variation when we model species responses to climate change, because otherwise we're overestimating range losses. So next we're gonna move into looking at how we can use genomic approaches to integrate uh, dispersal and barriers to movement into our models. Now we said before that the ability of organism to sim simply shift the range and reach climatically suitable areas is likely to be impeded by landscape barriers to movement. Now these barriers can be natural barriers like rivers, mountain ranges, but they can also be anthropogenic barriers like urban expansion, roads, deforestation. Usually species distribution modeling completely ignore dispersal of barriers to movement. When models have accounted for that, they used, for example, dispersal kernels based on the known dispersal distance of juveniles. So they're restricted future suitable areas based on how far the species can move. Now, the problem with this approach is that it totally disregards the effect of landscape barriers. It assumes the species can just move across anything. And we know that's not always the case. So we used instead the landscape genetics or landscape genomics approach, which relates spatial genetic patterns to the effect of the landscape on individual movement. How does it work? You can either look at adaptive variation or neutral variation. What we're interested in is the spatial distribution of variation. Now, this variation can be genetic diversity, patterns of genetic diversity, for example, but it can also be genetic connectivity or gene flow between populations. And we relate this to either climatic conditions or different landscape features to understand what affects either patterns of genetic diversity or patterns of gene flow between populations. So, for example, we use this kind of approaches to look at, to, to identify landscape barriers to movement across spatial scales. And here is an example from the bat, um, gray, the gray longed bat, Plicotus uh, austriacus, across England. And what we found that um, the genetic uh, connectivity between populations is affected by distance to unimproved grasslands or meadows, the main foraging habitat of this bat. Now, this habitat has been disappearing from England over the past century. And as a result of that, we see quite extreme fragmentation between our populations and very reduced uh, genetic connectivity. We also use this kind of approach to predict uh, range shift and range shift corridors uh, that will enable species to move between areas that are currently suitable but will become unsuitable in the future into areas that will retain suitability in the future, marked here in black. So what we identify in here in the map in pink is areas where due to landscape suitability, individuals can use to move into climatically suitable areas in the future. We also identify these pinch points or areas with reduced landscape suitability, which means that individuals will not be able to shift the range and move through these areas. And finally, we use this kind of approach also to look at evolutionary rescue potential. And when I talk about evolutionary rescue, what I mean is maladapted population being able to survive as a result of gene flow from adapted populations. So to do that, we use the landscape genomics approach. Stage, stage one, we identify landscape features that limit gene flow. And stage two, we project barriers to gene flow to maladapted locations. So from adapted populations or individuals into maladapted uh, individuals or populations. I'm gonna show you how this works. So going back to our example of the two uh, cryptic meiotis species uh, found around the Iberian Peninsula. So first we looked at um, what landscape elements affect genetic connectivity between individuals. And what we found is that in the case of both these bats, forest cover variables and topographic variables are the most important variables affecting genetic connectivity. Now this is not surprising given that these two species are forest bats are closely associated with forests. Next, we use this information to create these movement density maps in order to assess the movement potential between 
those populations or locations that are at the, uh, that contain individuals associated with hot and dry conditions in white to those locations or populations that contain individuals that are associated with cold and wet conditions in gray. Now in these movement density maps, yellow colors, our yellow greenish colors represent high movement density or potential, whereas blue areas represent low movement potential. And what we can see, we can see some of our populations are nicely connected, showing that there is a potential for adaptive gene flow to move into these maladapted or cold and wet adapted populations. However, it's not likely to reach all populations and some locations of population will still not be able to obtain a genetic variation that's adapted, that's related to warmer and drier conditions. And what this means is that evolutionary rescue is possible. However, it depends on adaptive potential as well as landscape barriers to movement. Okay, finally, I wanted to finish by uh, talking a bit about an integrated framework that we developed in order to combine this kind of genomic data in our climate change vulnerability assessments. And what we ask here is which populations are under highest threat uh, from climate change? And we, do, we assess this based on their exposure to future changes, their sensitivity. And when I talk about sensitivity, I talk in terms of genomic adaptations, and finally, the rain shift potential. So we focus here on the gray longer bat, Plecotus austriacus, and we sampled 10 populations from across the climatic gradient experienced by the bat in the Iberian Peninsula and in southern England. And we generated a um, genomic data set using RAD sequencing of uh, around 6,000 SNPs for these 95 individuals. So first we look at the exposure. Will they be affected by future changes? And to do that, we use species distribution models. The models on the left are present conditions, on the right, future conditions by the end of the century using the more severe emission scenario. And once again, climatic suitability ranges from unsuitable in blue to suitable in orange yellow colors. Now, what we can see is that under future conditions, three of our populations will be found under unsuitable conditions. We also look at environmental dissimilarity between current conditions and future conditions. So we identify these populations marked here in yellow that are found in areas where maximum temperatures will increase by over eight degrees Celsius. We also identify those populations that are found in areas where summer rainfall will be reduced by over 50%. So these are marked here in black. Okay, next we move to look at sensitivity. Can they actually cope with future changes? So to do that, we first have to identify any loci associated with um, adaptations to warmer and drier conditions. As I explained before, two conditions that are very important for bat survival and reproductive success and would also change dramatically under climate change around the Mediterranean basin. So this time we use a combination of genome scans uh, using base scan and genotype environmental association analysis using latent factor mixed models. And we identify eight what we call climate adaptive uh, SNPs. So those uh, genomic regions that are associated with hot and, hot and dry conditions in essence or maximum temperatures and summer rainfall. So then we look at the, the frequency of this adaptive variation associated with maximum temperatures and low summer rainfall among the different populations. And we identify those populations that have a low frequency of adaptive variation of, or adaptive variation for future climate change. So hot and dry adaptations. Next, we look at movement potential. So can they actually get away? And we used again the landscape genomics approach. So we first identify the landscape variable that affect current patterns of gene flow or genetic connectivity between our populations. Then we generate these movement, potential movement density maps where yellow areas represent high connectivity um, between populations, given, bearing in mind the effect of landscape on genetic connectivity. And we can see that under current conditions, all our populations in the Iberian Peninsula are nicely connected to each other. And we also see some amounts of gene flow occurring all the way from the Iberian Peninsula to England. 
Then we project it into what will happen under future conditions. And what we see overall is reduced uh, landscape connectivity. And in fact, four of our populations will become isolated from under pop other populations under future conditions. We also see reduced uh, potential for movement out of the Iberian Peninsula. Okay, so we combine everything together in the risk assessment framework in order to divide our populations based on the level of vulnerability. So vulnerability ranges from low vulnerability on the left to high vulnerability on the right. So here on the left, uh, the low vulnerability side, we have these populations that are found in areas where conditions are not going to change dramatically and still remain suitable for the species. These populations are not as sensitive to future changes because they already have adaptive variations that are uh, the variation that is associated with warmer and drier conditions. And in terms of movement, they will retain landscape connectivity, meaning that they'll be able to shift the range if they need to. Now, at the other extreme end, at the high vulnerability end, we have these populations that are found in areas where climatic conditions will become unsuitable and extremely different from current conditions. These populations are sensitive to future changes because they don't have the adaptive variation that is associated with warmer and drier conditions. And finally, they're found in areas that will become isolated under future conditions, so will lose their landscape connectivity, which means that they won't be able to simply move away and shift their ranges. Now here in the middle, we have our populations that will experience changes under climate change. The area may become climatically unsuitable for them. However, they either have adaptive variation that's already associated with warmer and drier conditions, or they're found in areas where they'll be able to still retain landscape connectivity, meaning they'll be able to shift the range if they need to. Okay, now we can use this kind of information to really inform our conservation management recommendations. So the conservation management intervention range from the least intense on the left to the most intense on the right. So if we start with our uh, low vulnerability populations, because they're found in areas that will retain climatic suitability in the future, and they already have adaptations that are associated with warmer and drier conditions, what we really want to do is to create protected areas or reserves around these areas to enable these populations to really thrive. Because this could be a source of uh, adaptive variations that can spread to other populations as well, as well as large populations that can survive under future conditions. So what we really want to do is enhance the habitat there to enable the populations to grow where they are. If you think about the other end, the high vulnerability populations, already these populations cannot stay where they are. They won't be able to survive there but they can't shift the range because they're going to lose landscape connectivity and become isolated. That means that the only management solution is really assisted translocation. So to physically go there, collect the bats and move them to another area. Now, although this is possible, it's not really feasible if you bear in mind the extent of um, biodiversity impacts that climate change will cause and the number of species and populations that will require this kind of intensive uh, management. So what will be more feasible is to focus more on these mid-vulnerability populations, where if we increase landscape connectivity, we can really enable these populations to shift the range on their own, as well as increase the spread of adaptive variation between populations that's enabling maladapted populations to survive under future climate change. Okay, so I'm gonna end with some uh, brief take home messages. First, I hope I managed to really show you the importance of using integrated approaches. And in particular, the importance of combining genomic data into our vulnerability assessments. The problem is that many people in the conservation field, they come from a more ecological background rather than genetic background. And as a result of that, genomic data is quite neglected in a lot of conservation management. However, what uh, the research I showed you here shows that if we ignore genomic data, we're really missing a very important part of the picture. And in particular, uh, when we think about models that estimate range losses under climate change, current models that ignore genetic data are maybe actually overestimating vulnerability to climate change. And this is why it's important to incorporate genomic data to really understand how species will respond. Now, the problem is overestimating vulnerability that can really lead to misguided conservation action.
Uh, finally, a lot of my work really highlights the importance of landscape connectivity as something that will first facilitate rain shifts, but also evolutionary rescue and the spread of adaptive variation. And this is where a lot of uh, conservation management under climate change needs to focus on, in my opinion. Okay, so I wanted to thank uh, the different funders that funded the research and the many collaborators that took part in it, as well as thanking you for listening.